Okay, the biology of Pythium and Phytophthora, 101. Both are oomycetes, and we call them fungal-like organisms because it turns out that they're not true fungi. They look and behave like fungi, and we often refer to them as fungi in a colloquial sense, but they actually belong to a different group of organisms. And they're water molds. They require lots of water for infection. And a recirculating water system is an ideal place for these pathogens to cause problems on plants. <clears throat> they produce abundant zoospores, which are readily disseminated in water. Now, zoospores are spores that can swim because they have two flagella, sort of like oars on them, that propel them through the water. Not only they can swim through the water, but they can follow a concentration gradient of chemicals that come from the root, so they can identify the host, swim to it, and infect. We call this process chemotaxis. They also produce clematospores and or oospores, which allow for long-term survival. And these structures can survive in dry conditions as well as wet conditions and soil and plant material and cracks and dust and, and, and many other places uh, that you can imagine. And they can survive for years. And colonized plant debris protects these organisms, whether they're in a mycelial form, that is the vegetative growth form, or clematospores or oospores and that they're protected from treatments that might be applied to the water. So once these organisms are inside the plant, whether it's dead plants or live plants, uh, they're protected from uh, treatments that are going to be applied to the water. This is a picture of Pythium in a culture. It sort of looks like somebody dropped some spaghetti and uh, the hyphae, the, the hyphae are the strands here that's the vegetative growth of the organism, and that's typically what we see when we look through the microscope, and that's the, the body of pythium, and those hyphal strands colonize the root tissue and uh, kill the root cells. Here we can actually see some pythium inside of a geranium root, and um, actually this is a stem tissue, and the black arrows are pointing to hyphae that come, they sort of come in and out of focus. There's only one plane of focus here, and it's hard to see, but um, they're all connected in some fashion. Okay, uh, talk a little bit about the oospores. So the structure on the left are the sexual organs of pythium. The spiny structure is a female organ called the oogonium, and the round structure on top of it is the male antheridium. And it has fertilized the oogonium, and we have a thick-walled oospore inside. And the oospore is key to the organism's survival. And this can allow the organism to survive for many years. On the right-hand side, we have Phytophthora. It looks a little different. Um, it has an antheridium in this particular species at the base of the oogonial stalk. And again, it's got a very thick-walled oospore inside. So the oogonium and the antheridium will sort of fade away and leave the oospores generally embedded in plant tissue in various places in your greenhouse. And when these are, these would be hard enough to kill with disinfectants if they were naked, but generally they are buried within root tissue or stem tissue where disinfectants are not going to have much of an effect. These are extremely small structures, 20 to 30 micrometers. We can only see them with a microscope. Here, let's go back to that caliber coa that had root rot. And let's take a little tiny piece of root and put it under the compound microscope so we can see what's in there. And what we see here are oospores of pythium. And there's quite a number of them in that very small piece of root. 
Now imagine how many oospores can be inside of this one small plug. And then imagine when you have thousands of disease plugs, how many oospores you might have in your greenhouse. Not to mention the fact that these, uh, these rotten roots kind of slough off, they break away, they get into the uh, irrigation system, they end up in the cracks and crevices of the, of the greenhouse floor, and so on and so forth. And this is why it can be difficult to sanitize a greenhouse after a disease episode with Pythium or Phytophthora, or for other fungi for that matter. These are Spurangia of Pythium in water, and the Spurangia are the lobed looking structures here. This is Pythium aphanodromadium. Now, Pythium has various types of, of Spurangia, but um, we will see a video later of uh, how the zoospores are produced in a vesicle that actually forms outside of the Spurangium. And we'll, we can see one with Phytophthora as well. Phytophthora sporangia are generally uh, quite distinctive. Um, they sort of look lemon-shaped like this one here. And these behave a little different than the Pythiums. With Phytophthora, the zoospores develop inside the sporangium. When they're all developed, they're released. And we'll see a, a small video of that as well. One of the ways that we identify or diagnose Pythium or Phytophthora in the diagnostic lab is we'll take some a piece of the infected tissue and we'll put it in water and see what grows out. And in 24 hours, if Pythium or Phytophthora are present, they'll produce their sporangia in the water. And in this case, we have a Calibrocoa plant and look at all of the sporangia that are pr produced on a small piece of root. And each one of those sporangia will produce 20 or 30 zoospores, swimming zoospores. So uh, we saw how many oospores can form in a small piece of root. Well, we can have many more zoospores produced from the same small piece of root. And it's the zoospores that are the infective propagules. They'll go down the water stream and bump into the next plant and adhere to the roots and infect them. This happens to be Phytophthora dreschleri. Here's a, uh, a pothos plant infected with Phytophthora tropicalis, and the name probably suggests uh, where this particular pathogen came from. Uh, you're right, uh, came from South America in the tropics somewhere, wherever pothos comes from. And so we bring these things up to the United States or we trade them from one greenhouse to another. Now if we were to scrape the edge of the stem, particularly toward the base of the plant where the soil is moist, we'll see all of these sporangia. And in some of these sporangia you can actually see uh, that zoospores have developed. Uh, here we see a movie of Phytophthora releasing zoospores that have developed inside the sporangium, and it looks like they're swimming aimlessly around. Actually, they are. But if there was a root in here, they would swim toward the root by the chemotax, as I mentioned earlier, adhere to the root, and then infect it. In the case of Pythium, the, um, a, an evacuation tube forms, and the protoplasm spills out of the sporangium proper and develops a extra sporangial vesicle in which the protoplasm then turns into zoospores. It's quite fascinating to watch this whole process. It only takes about 10 minutes for the protoplasm to turn from a liquid and differentiate into the zoospores. And you'll be able to see when this vesicle breaks uh, how active and ready to go these zoospores are. Let's switch to another organism. This hydroponic basal system is infested with Fusarium oxysporum, and this organism is extremely uh, pathogenic to basal and causes a vascular wilt. 
about 10% of the plants in here are infected. Perhaps they don't look look at, like it, but uh, as the temperature warms up in this greenhouse, a lot of these plants will wilt. And this was a complete loss uh, for the grower. As you can imagine, when one plant gets infected and then it produces spores, now these aren't swimming spores, but the spores readily travel down the irrigation stream where they bump into the next plant and infect it. Of course, some of the plants continue on to the next plant, the next plant, and so on and so forth. If this water circuit recirculated, then the fusarium starts at the top. And before you know it, uh, nearly all the plants will be infected. And, and like we had last time, we have a situation where there's going to be a lot of root pieces left over after we clean up, and those root pieces will have infective propagules of fusarium. Let's take a look at a, a root that's infected with this vascular pathogen. Here we have these large canoe-shaped structures inside the vessels of the, inside the conduct, water conducting vessels of the plant and it's plugged them up uh, very nicely, and water is just simply not going to travel up into the plant as we need it. Up in the upper left-hand corner are clematospores. I haven't shown you a picture of those yet, but clematospores are simply thick-walled spores that allow the fungus to survive for many years in the absence of a host. So again, we'll have infected plant debris left over after we clean this up. And one of the important things to do is to get rid of all of this plant debris so we can adequately disinfest the system. <laughs>